got a license to talk. Shocking. Positively shocking. And the words are for your ears only. I think you got the point. Welcome to The Words Are Not Enough. On episode number 13 of The Words Are Not Enough, the team has a special announcement on how you can be featured in a future episode of the show. Danny Boyle is making huge waves in the Bondverse as he may be the one directing Bond 25. And we give you our picks for who should score the next Bond film. Stay tuned. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Words Are Not Enough. I am Griffin 008 Schiller, and I am joined here by my co-host... Brody 005 Cervelli. Hey, there we go. And if you've never listened to the show, yes, these numbers are very arbitrary. They really mean nothing, but... We chose them and we're kind of sticking. Yeah, with I kind of wish right? I picked 004. Actually, four is my favorite number. So, oh, yeah. maybe you could change <laughs> four. Eight's my favorite number. That's why I went with double. Yeah, I, should, I mean, maybe I should just wait for um, 004 to get killed in like in action, and then I can just assume his position. Uh, then you can assume. <clears> the posi- <throat> there you go. Perfect. Perfect. And then naturally, I'm I'm the next in line after. After Mr. Mr. Craig or, or whoever <laughs> is in the 007 role. <laughs> Anyways, uh, h- how are you doing on this this great Friday? It's, I guess it yeah, is. Yeah, <laughs> it's, de- it's definitely a Friday. Um, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm not great, and I think I think you deliberately asked me this question because you knew that I'm not great. Oh, I am. Yeah, no, I know I did because I wanted to... and so yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, the Which, yeah, the hangovers yeah, are not, not cuz the night before that you <laughs> were hungover. So, and it was like a shockingly bad one. Oh, it was really bad. Yeah, I was like I I I was like immovable the whole day physically just on the floor. It, you have I don't know if you've ever like experienced this, but there have been times where you just like the next day you're so hungover that it's like you can't even lay in your bed. Your bed's not comfortable yeah, anymore. It's absolutely. like you have to lay on the floor in a weird position on your stomach in order to make the sickness in your stomach go away. It's it's absolutely awful. That's Let me tell you, I, I haven't today felt today that too. bad in, in quite some yeah. time. That's how you felt uh-huh, today? Yeah. So you were lying on the I floor? I woke up um, this morning and I, honest to God, I felt like I was still drunk. And then... <laughs> I climbed out of bed and I said, yeah, I sort of like got in, I, I sort of sat in my, at my desk chair and yeah. like just tried to find a position there and it didn't really work until so like, yeah, I got on the floor and like it, nothing yeah, was comfortable yeah. and I just felt like I was going to barf no matter where I was. And so I'm like, you know what? Yeah. If I'm going to barf, uh, it might as well be in bed. And so I got back into bed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! And so it was just—it was really funny because I was telling you about this yesterday because yeah. we were supposed to record yesterday, but I—I I couldn't do it. And then you were like, "Oh, dude, no worries." And then like we come back today, <laughs> and you're like, "Man, let me tell you something." So it's just like I—I yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think uh, Mister 007 would be too proud of us because you know he just wipes that stuff off like it's nothing, he did, right? He—he yeah. he has another drink of the morning for breakfast. He gets like angry drunk is the thing. He—he he gets yeah, like he never gets it's, stupid drunk he's always like i feel like he could be trashed and then still like have perfect aim whereas i couldn't even like aim in the toilet like it was <laughs> wow this is one heck of an intro to this show this is, <laughs> yeah now you can definitely tell that we're not double oh that's it yeah right? but that was the dead giveaway <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the, it that was the only was the thing giveaway. Yeah, right, of course, because we were totally fine other mm-hmm. than that. I mean, just <laughs> clearly we, we are field agents. Like, I don't know what else to say. It's just, yeah, obviously. It's the way it peak is. Physi- <laughs> peak physique and, like, <laughs> mental capabilities, you know. <laughs> oh, best my gosh. Yeah. Well, now that you know how the past two days have gone for oh. us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, now you yeah, know about my, been, my, uh, my, my pissing regimen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. But we, you, Brody has divulged the gross details of his past 24 hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> geez, Louise. Well, anyways, we got a we got a pretty hefty episode for you guys today. A oh. um, lot of juicy stuff in there. Finally, a yeah. lot of, of talk about uh, Danny Boyle, as you probably have heard um, in in the news and such. But um, but it's going to be a really full show. It's going to be great, full of uh, great 
enriching discussion. But before all of that, if you guys have been paying attention to the Men vs. Movies Twitter, which is where I tweet everything that has to do with Men vs. Movies and all that stuff, but then also the words are not enough, um, we have a special announcement. And of course, it wouldn't be the words are not enough unless we came up with a uh, punny name for this announcement segment. So anytime we have an announcement that we're going to throw on the show, show um, it's going to be titled, Now Pay Attention, 007. Excellent. Yes. Literally, I'll, I'll give Brody that one. He, <laughs> he thought of it yesterday, um, and, and I think it's I think it's brilliant. I'm a big so, fan, um, yeah. I believe in the last episode we were saying how we were going to discuss a Bond film each month, um, and I think last time we recorded we didn't have it entirely figured out no, yet. Yeah, we, yeah. we knew where we wanted to take it, but we didn't know how we wanted to do it. And so what ended up being um, you know, what 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 would have ended up being us discussing Die Another Day back in February um, actually got postponed. And, and funny enough, we'll get to Die Another Day in a second. <laughs> so um, we decided I that the best that. way yeah. to do this, right, it's it's really kind of funny how, how things um, kind of panned really? out. But so the Go ahead, yeah, go so, ahead. So, yeah. so if, oh, no, 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 you're okay. It's just kind of funny. Um, so a few days ago, I, I went, I mean, I've been tweeting out stuff like, hey, we got special announcements, announcement. But then uh, a few days ago, I went live on the, the Men vs. Movies YouTube channel. I was like, hey, guys, so we are going to be discussing a Bond film every month, and we want to integrate you guys into the discussion. So uh, I put up a poll on Twitter with four selections for the films that you guys want us to talk, or I'm sorry, the film that you guys want us to talk about during the month of... Um, during the month of March and all that good stuff. Because, like I said, Bond film every month. Maybe we'll do two since we're a little behind now. But um, but as it stands right now, one Bond film per month. Um, so the sele- the the films I listed in the in the poll were The Living Daylights, The Man with the Golden Gun, Die Another Day, and From Russia with Love. And the reason I chose we chose those um films, I know it seems kind of like random and arbitrary, but we chose those films because we didn't want to put a Craig film in there because he's the most recent Bond and he'd get a lot of traction. We didn't want yep. to put a classic like um, you know Golden Eye or Goldfinger in there because obviously that would be the go-to one. We kind of wanted to choose some of the more obscure ones, so we put in two really good ones and two not so good ones. Although I think you can classify one of those enjoyable in a, in a fun and dumb kind yeah. of way. Um, so th- that was kind of our reasoning behind choosing Honestly, those both films. Of them are a fun and a dumb way. Well, one of them I really don't care to rewatch very often. The other one I could pop in at any time just because it's so stupid and and have a fun time with. Uh-huh. But um, but anyway, so yes, we put out the poll two days ago, and you guys voted in the film that you voted for us to discuss during the month of March. Weirdly enough, was Die Another oh, Day, man. which was the film we were originally going to talk about in the month Hard to keep a of good February. Film so down. I guess, That's what it is. Yeah, uh, I know. I guess you guys just really have um, quite the bit of affection for this one. It's rightfully so. I, I'll tell you what. It's there, there are people who love it despite its flaws. There's people who think it's a, an abomination. <laughs> which I mean, I think everyone can kind of agree that it's not a good movie. But there is like it's it's kind of dependent upon. Whether you enjoy the ridiculous the ridiculousness of it or it just completely loses you, um, which that'll be for the discussion. We can go either yeah. way. So we will be discussing die another day. We don't have a date for that planned yet, but it'll be probably like uh, a week or two weeks from now. That sounds about right. Some something like yeah. that. Um, so in the meantime, what the the way that thing is gonna? Well, before, let me gather my thoughts here. <laughs> The way that video will go down, because it is different from what we were originally going to do, the way the Die Another Day discussion will will go down is it'll be around a 30 to 40 minute discussion. It will include video, um, so you'll get to see our, our lovely faces. It'll very much be more of a... Um, like like a discussion about the film, yeah. um, not necessarily a review, but just kind of like an open conversation about it. So like I said, 30, 40 minute discussion, it will include video and it will also be available on our YouTube channel. Obviously, if we're doing video, it's going to, well, if it's content, it's going to go on the YouTube channel, but then it will uh, also be on the regular Words Are Not Enough podcast feed. So if you're someone who listens to us as an uh, like audio only on the fly, uh, either through iTunes or iHeartRadio or something like that, you still will be able to uh, 
enjoy it this for what it is. It's not going to be just a straight video only yeah. thing that goes straight to the YouTube channel. No, we we do want to include it as part of the podcast feed because this is this is our show. It's the word, words are not enough. So, but the cool thing here is is that we will save time towards the end of this, of the discussion for your Stardust reactions and try to have an open conversation regarding the film with you all. So, if you are not familiar with Stardust, it's essentially an app where people post like 30 second reactions reviews of television movies um stuff like that stuff that they've recently watched it's just a quick 30 second thing where you post your initial thoughts on a film and the cool thing about stardust is you can tag other people in your videos and by doing so we get notified of your video and and we can there's like a process to downloading it and we can integrate that reaction into our content which is it's it's a nice way to have an open conversation with you guys without actually you know dialing you up on like Skype or something like that because yeah. I'm sure there's like plenty of you other. So so anyways, um, the way this whole thing is gonna go, you like we said from from when this video release it releases, it'll probably be about like two weeks or so before we um release the die another day discussion. So you guys will have time to watch the film and and give us your um. Give us your thoughts on it through Stardust. But basically, the whole the whole way this thing is going to work is if you do not have Stardust, you can check the description of wherever you're watching. There will be a link there to download the app. It's free, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then go follow me over at G Schiller. It's literally just G S C H I L L E R. You'll find me because um, that's that's the um, the user that you are going to tag is going to be me. So you're going to watch the film, you're going to post your reaction to Die Another Day, tagging me, and then there will be a chance for you to be featured in our discussion video. Ooh. Remember, I said that our discussion video on Die Another Day is going to be video. So, you, obviously we'll see you there. <laughs> and then uh, if you're watching it audio only, you'll still get the audio from that and stuff like that, but it's just it'll be more interactive when we can actually see you. Um, so all that good stuff. So like I said, if you don't have Stardust, be sure to check the description down below. Click the link, sign up, and all that good stuff. So we'll be doing this every month or so. So if you're not featured in this month's video, you could be featured next month. Or if we just really like your reactions, we'll keep featuring you. So <laughs> so uh, to put a cap on all of this, Die Another Day discussion will be coming in the coming weeks. We want your Stardust reactions to be featured in the video. So get to reacting guys and tag G Schiller me in your reaction so that we can uh, put you up on air and and also keep a lookout for next month's poll for the Bond film you would like us to review obviously we're not going to post that until probably the end of the month or the beginning of, of April all that good stuff um, we'll, we'll get a nice selection of films there for you so um, so that's the whole spiel. That's the special announcement. Brody, do you have any comments on the, the special announcement? Um, no, I, th- I think that pretty much speaks for itself. I uh, it's, ex- it's exciting. It'll be cool to sort of interact yeah. with people a little bit. So yeah. don't let us down. Do it. <laughs> yeah, no. We, we Yeah, I mean, the, the reasoning behind this is we really just want to have like an open discussion on the film with you guys. Since, I mean, obviously, you could, we, sure, we could just sit here, two talking microphones, and talk about it. But we wanted to be a little bit more, you know, energetic, interactive, um, conversational, which is which is always fun. We always love responding to you guys in the comment section. So, yeah. and all that good stuff. So, with that out of the way, let's move on to our first official segment of the day, and that is Tomorrow Never Lies, or Danny Boyle Never really? Lies, because this whole segment is going to be dealing with that well, maybe he Danny does. Boyle-ness. Maybe he does I know. What, what, is going on? what is going on with Danny Boyle over there and the folks at Eon? So... You never know. As I'm sure, just just buckle buckle down here, guys, because this is a lot of a lot of information that we got to go through before we can finally discuss it. So, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the front runner to direct Bond 25 is now Danny Boyle. It is vi- is made very clear by all by many publications from from all across the the interwebs and all the good stuff. So, I, I just want to kind of recap how that happened, and then also to where we are today. So. Mm-hmm. The story first broke on February 20th from Justin Kroll at Variety, which if you don't follow him on Twitter, highly encourage you to. He's got like breaking news on breaking like exclusives on there and all that good stuff. So uh, if you're into that, 
There you go. So um, Boyle, Boyle has a keen interest in the project and has always wanted to direct a Bond film. He is currently developing a project for working title, but with no cast currently attached, there is always the possibility of pushing that movie back to direct the 25th installment in the series. Boyle has long been in MGM and Eon sites to direct a Bond movie, going back to 2012 Skyfall and actually 2015's Spectre. Uh-huh. Sources tell Variety that White Boy Rick director Jan Demange was considered a top choice for the job, but there's been one last push to go after a more well-known name. No official offer has been made as of when this article was published to Boyle. And, and as far as we know, no official official offer has been made uh, to Danny Boyle to direct the film. So that still remains mm-hmm. true. So that's the first story. Then a <laughs> follow-up story from Mar- Mike Fleming. <laughs> Fleming, Ooh. there we go. Uh, broke just the next day with more details. So that was on February 20th. That would make this February 21st. So when he directed the opening ceremonies of the 2012 London Olympics, Boyle helmed Daniel Craig in a filmed bit that involved an action scene with a cameo from Queen Elizabeth II. So there is history between the actor and filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Boyle had an idea for a very specific 007 movie, and he and his transpotting partner, John Hodge, have teamed up to work out the beats. Hodge is writing that version, and if all works out, that would be the 007 film that Boyle would helm. So Hodge won't be done for a couple months, but when he turns in the script, one of two things will happen. MGM and the producers will like will like it enough to shelve the movie they were contemplating with uh, right, the listed writers that we've been mentioning on here constantly, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, whose 007 credits include Skyfall, Spectre, Casino Royale, I believe the world is Going back enough, to the world is not enough. Yeah, so Die Another Day is yes, well, they. Yeah. Yes, right, right. Well, <laughs> I excluded Die Another <laughs> Day for a reason. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the... Oh, I mean, man. also, Quantum um, of Solace, like, you didn't mention that as well, but... Right, yeah. uh, yes, I was only natural that I didn't include that. <laughs> um, but anyways, and they will make the version that was cooked up by this train spotting team. Yep. Otherwise... If they don't like the Boyle and Hodge script, Boyle won't direct the film and it will be back to the other script for which MGM and the producers had assembled a short list of uh, consisting of of all the directors we basically mentioned on the show in the past. So like Jan Demange, Denis Villeneuve, I I believe Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan was thrown around there, but he's not going to do it. Um, So really, uh, you know, this is where it gets kind of interesting because, um, their fallbacks, they might not be able to fall back on. So on March 6th, according to The Hollywood Reporter, it was, it was reported that Jan Demange, who was heavily rumored to be the front runner on Eon's list of potential Bond 25 directors, uh-huh. will not only be directing the upcoming Matthew McConaughey film White Boy Rick, but has also been tapped by J.J. Abrams and Jordan Peele to join the team on HBO's new series Lovecraft Country. Mm -hmm. So Demange will direct the pilot episode and executive produce the series. So at this point, it would seem that MGM and Eon's backup is looking to be unavailable. Um, Because, I mean, obviously directing a film and then being part of the the creative team over at HBO series, that's, that's a lot of time commitment. Um, so thank God for Danny Boyle, right? Well, <laughs> that actually may be even trickier than we thought as well. So <laughs> on March 4th, according to The Hollywood Reporter, again, Danny Boyle and Love Actually screenwriter Richard Curtis are teaming for an untitled comedy. Like I mentioned in the um, the original one for, for um, was it, working title films. So and, and that's going to be set up by, by working title and Universal and all that stuff like that. So uh, as of March 4th, the details have are, are being kept under lock and key, but it is known to be a musical um, set during the 60s or 70s dealing with, uh, with the Beatles. And if th- they're eyeing to shoot it as early as this summer, if casting can come together. So if that project gets green, the green light, this could be uh, kind of tricky for the producers at Eon should they like the script Hodge um, produces from them. So it would seem that progress on Bond 25 is uh, back to step one should all of those things go (laughs) completely horribly wrong. Um, However, there is good news because as of yesterday, March 8th, I believe this is the most recent news that we have regarding the whole Danny Boyle situation. Just kind of been giving you guys a timeline of how we got here. So um, 
there's an interesting story that's emerged from Baz uh, Bemig Boye at the Daily Mail, and which if you are not following him on Twitter or any of that stuff, he is a Bond insider. He always is tweeting out good stuff about it, um, and when he puts together an article, it should grab your attention because it's more than likely accurate. So, um, it would appear that 007 himself, Daniel Craig, is pulling out all the stops to ensure Danny Boyle does, in fact, helm the next Bond project. So, Craig attended a meeting with James Bond producers Barbara Broccoli, Michael G. Wilson, and Boyle, and his train spotting writing partner, John Hodge, where the filmmakers pitched their vision for Bond 25. So, Right here, I, I'm going to be quoting, uh, I believe, uh, one of uh, the Mick Boyer's sources. So, they took the idea to Barbara, never believing for a minute she would go for it. But she's excited by the concept. And so is her, I'm sorry, and so is her producing partner, Michael. A closely connected source, like I mentioned, told Baz, uh, Baz Mick Boyer in uh, Los Angeles. And then the source goes on to say the following. But the most important cheerleader in the meeting was Daniel, and he was pushing for Danny to direct. He loves the fact that it's something completely different. He has not signed up for more of the same old Bond. We are going to come back to that little um, <laughs> that little comment there, because that is, that is good news there. So... Um, Hodge has not completed the screenplay as of yet, but once it is finished and all parties are satisfied, it would seem that Boyle and company will get the green light. As for Boyle's work on his upcoming musical, Broccoli and Wilson's Eon Productions and executives at MGM have formed an unusual alliance with working titles, Tim Bevan and Eric Fellner, to quote-unquote smooth the way so that if the Boyle-Hodge bond idea gets the green light, the pair can move seamlessly from All You Need Is Love, which is apparently the title for this um, 60s, 70s musical, to... Bond 25. So, the big boye source then goes on to say the following, the seed of Danny and John's bond was planted when Danny directed that incredible short film featuring Daniel Craig for the uh, the, the opening of the 2012 London Olympics. That's where the bond for what <laughs> sorry for one of a better words, <laughs> bond was formed. One of my big time sources told me I'd be shot if I told you the story idea they've come up with, but it's pure movie gold. And then he also goes on to say, everybody is rooting for this to happen. I mean, the idea that Danny might be able to shoot the Curtis film and then be shooting Bond by the end of the year is breathtaking. And then he finishes it up by saying, it's high stakes British movie producing of the highest order. Your queen should give them all medals if they pull it off. <laughs> I love that last quote. Um, and to kind of wrap up this segment nicely, but Mick Boye seems convinced, especially after talking with his sources, that Craig and Boyle will be teaming up to tackle what will be a wild ride for Bond 25. Are you guys still listening? Oh because that was a boatload of information that I just went through, and there is a lot <clears throat> to discuss. So, uh, Brody, I'm going to give you the floor first. What is going on? What is going on? Well, um, this is interesting. This is actually really, really cool. Uh, it's got a lot of the, like, sort of, the, I mean, if, you, if you're a regular listener, uh, you sort of know what my reaction is going to be to this. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've been a fan of, of Danny Boyle doing one of these films for a, like a long time now. And I love the fact, the, the, the best the best piece of uh, information, it's all speculation, but um, as to whether it's true or not, but... Um, well, but it's it's pretty concrete speculation. Well, I, I mean, say. like I mean, I feel like the, the broad strokes are definitely probably true. I, I think the specifics is when it, when when these like they like when they say like oh he doesn't want to do the same old bond that sounds really needlessly inflammatory um same i mean like i don't know some of the things in there seem like like some of the details seem like they could be possibly not true but sure the the, the broad strokes like Danny Boyle and um what was it um Hodge they're probably yeah, definitely being tapped. All that stuff, I believe, one hundred percent. Sure. The, the the thing that this and this is the part that might not be true, but I kind of like, and I wish, I hope it is. It's the part how, um, essentially, Danny Boyle's had this idea for a Bond film for a while, and mm-hmm. he's 
like passionate about doing his idea. You know what I mean? That's I love yeah. that. I think that's exactly what needs to happen. That's what that's that's what that was the best thing about Skyfall was that was like uh, Sam Mendes was like, "This is the Bond film I want to make. This is it." And now, yeah, yeah. please let me make it. And so then they did. You know what I mean? Like I better than having to then um, either work within someone else's story or something like that. Like he's he's passionate about it. He's obviously passionate about the series. And so I, I think it's great. And also, um, I one thing I love that I was um, when I, w- I said I was going to mention um, on the show when we first talked about this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I love that they're getting uh, John Hodges. I mean, he's a he's a good writer, right? First of all, uh-huh. um, like he did Train Spotting. Um, he he's he's a play, he's a playwright, I believe, but he's also done like um, mo- most of not not all, but like he's done a, quite a few of Danny Boyle's films. I think he I think sure. he also did um, 128 Days, right? Uh oh, what, no, 127 hours. 27, yeah, no, sorry, I, no, I yeah, was thinking of yeah. 28 days later, and uh, then <laughs> he had 127, 127 hours. Yeah, yeah, he does a lot of numbered films. Yeah, yeah. Um, watch this one be like, yeah, it'll have a number in it for something. But um, right, right. No, but I really love that they they like bringing in a new writer because I think that is just all of the. I mean, I I, I don't want to rag on Purvis and Wade. They're good, but they're, they're, they're very they're good, very workmanlike. And yeah. we've mentioned this before. I've mentioned this before that like um, they always do better when they're working with someone else. Um, right, right. So like in uh, you had Paul Haggis who did Casino Royale, and then you had mm-hmm. John Logan who did Skyfall. Um, mm-hmm. and I think it'd be really it's it's really really cool that. He's bringing in a new writer, never done a Bond film before, who's just coming in, who's just a proven talent. That excites me almost as much as the Danny Boyle thing, because it's like, I, I just love that. I love the... Um, right, right. Like the, it, it, Even if he does, even if he falls back on tropes of his own writing, they're tropes we haven't seen in a Bond script before. So sure, yeah. So that's, that's going to be exciting. Not to, not to say that he has, like, tropish writing. I, I've, I'm just saying, like, even if it were him just doing more of the same for him, it's new for the series. Um, yeah, which exactly. is really really it, cool. It, this, yeah, I mean this this whole team up would be a, a nice breath of fresh air in the the universe. Um, something really that we haven't seen before. Yeah, it'd be really, it'd be really really exciting. Um, and so that gets me really pumped. The the, the passion going in gets me really pumped. Um, well, it, what it's sounding like is everyone is just like blown away by what Danny Boyle wants to do. Yeah. I mean, kind of similar to when we were talking about when Jan Demange was first announced, he like gave him a pitch for a story and they were like, holy crap, we got to do this. But it seems that they, they want to go with big name talent. And I wonder if it's to bring more people into the theater. Like, do they not feel that a, a bond film directed by Jan Demange will fare as well as, as a bond film directed by Danny Boyle? Because really, um, other than cinephiles like us and people who really follow film, how many of your, you know, just regular movie going audience, how many of them really know who Danny Boyle is? They've probably seen some of his films, but I wouldn't imagine that Danny Boyle is a household, household I mean, neither name is for Sam Mendes. Like, yeah. um, well, I guess, well, I, uh, no, yeah, yeah, you're, you're probably I feel right. Like people yeah, people that's, will that's know true. like, Oh, I know of like American beauty, but I don't know Sam Mendes. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the same with Danny Boyle. I, I think I feel like but that's you're going too far down the rabbit hole almost because I feel like any filmmaker who isn't like Steven Spielberg is kind of like that for a lot of people. So. Oh, I I, I wouldn't say that. I think J.J. Abrams well, yeah, has become well, a household well, name. That's what I mean. Like, yeah, I, be like I'd a, say Christopher Nolan is a ho- household. That's name. what I mean, though. You're, that's my that's my point. Unless like, unless you're like, unless your name is a brand, like Christopher Nolan's is a brand, J.J. Abrams is a brand, Steven Spielberg is a brand, unless your name has mm-hmm. that kind of, like, reputation, I feel like the average person doesn't know many filmmakers. So I almost think... I don't know if that's the... Okay. I yeah. think in the trailer you could probably have, like, from the director of Train Spotting or from the director of, like... You know what I mean? Yeah, You could probably like do that. something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, But... I think it's almost about like the prestige that comes with it. it, it the, sure, yeah, it was because I mean Danny Boyle is an Academy Award 
nominated if or winning too i yeah. believe right did he win i don't know if he won best director but i know um but he's been nominated Slumdog millionaire won, like swept that year yeah. oh oh right yeah right there yeah Slumdog millionaire i mean his film won best picture yeah. so i guess we can kind of rope him in with it i mean he may not have won best director but um i i don't know don't quote us on that we, <laughs> did, we did not look that up but um but yeah okay yeah, i guess that's a good point there's the prestige that comes with it but uh, you know if yon demange like Get, did a pitch that blew them away, I, which I, I, I don't if, think if we are pitch, to believe. I don't know if that pitch happened. I'm, so are you thinking that maybe that 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 was? I wouldn't say fabrication, but exaggeration. Probably exaggeration. You would say he probably they, he they probably, clearly were interested in him. You know, for sure. And he probably gave them an idea. He probably had something, right? Because I doubt. Yeah, I doubt. And director goes meets with filmmaker, like meets with a producer, and doesn't have an idea. You know what I mean? Oh um, yeah, absolutely. Especially someone unknown. You know, what I mean, you don't want to meet with like the broccolis and not have an idea. Right. Um, right. One of the most like, yeah, one of the biggest like producing families in Europe. And you're just like, Oh yeah, I sorry. I don't have anything. Um, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure he, but yeah, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if it blew them away. I mean, I, I don't think they would have kept looking if they were like completely hundred percent sold. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. Um, well, the, the, the kind of just kind of, so we're saying on the on demand yeah. thing, I guess it it is, we should mention that even though all things are looking right, that Danny Boyle and uh, John Hodge will be the creative team behind bond 25. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there still is that chance that they don't like, the script that maybe it's a little too Danny Boyle for what they want to go for. And so if that happens, then they're literally back at square one. Cause like we said, Jan Demange is on doing an HBO series. He's writing and directing his own, or he's at least directing his own movie, white boy, Rick with Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Um, Christopher Nolan is not going to get involved. Uh, Denis Villeneuve is working on Dune. I, I I'm pretty sure David McKenzie has something up his sleeve. Who was another name that was tossed around. So they are literally back at square one and have to basically go into full director hunting mode ASAP if this thing does not go the way that we are expecting it to. Yeah, and I I think maybe that's the other part of this story that makes me feel a little bit like um, the stakes have been inflated to, like, make it more of a story. I don't know. They really have, yeah, yeah. I feel like maybe, like, I I have a really hard time believing that, because Eon Productions pretty much primarily deals in bond right like oh yeah my god it's the yeah, thing and yeah and so i feel like they wouldn't just like well we're gonna put all of our chips on this danny boyle thing and see what happens like yeah i, I, well, I, I, I highly guess it, doubt that they'd, they'd be pretty incompetent if they were like just saying like well we'll just we'll just if they were throwing all their eggs in one basket yeah that, like that i, I feel thing. like yeah. while um hodges is working on the script they're probably shopping around still um sure that's that's to say even it, maybe that maybe that is maybe that's the exaggerated part maybe there isn't as much writing on Hodge's script as we thought. It's more about like just get the script done and then we'll go from there. Like I don't think yeah, just get the the general set pieces in line. Do we like the story that you're going to tell? Can we work with yeah. this and you know iron out? The I don't kinks? think it's like yeah, maybe maybe the ultimatum has been kind of exaggerated. Sure. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I just get really skeptical whenever like I read a uh, a breaking news scoop that has like like. Uh, uh, an excess of drama in it because I feel like these th- there's drama obviously sure, in Hollywood yeah, yeah. Um, especially when it comes to like when you have creative people like sort of working together but I yeah. don't I just don't believe that there's like that much um, like sort of by the like, like seat of their pants kind of decision making going on right yeah. well and if you you know just reading all of this it, it would seem that like everything is riding on Hodge's script yes, like yeah. e- like Hodge's script has to be effing perfect in order for this thing to just go through um, which it doesn't it seems like they've cl- they, clearly they have enough faith in what uh, Boyle and Hodge pitched them that they're working out a deal here with Working Title so that there can be an easy transition from this musical that Boyle is doing um, into Bond 25. And like um, Bimik Boye said, um, Bond probably will be shot by Danny Boyle um, by the end of this year, which would make sense. Yeah, and I mean, and if it comes down to two, like, between doing this Beatles movie or doing the Bond film... I gotta believe that Danny Boyle would do the Bond film because I would too. Bond, because this you, is like a once in a lifetime well, thing. Well, not yeah. only that, yeah. So he's passionate about it, and he he loves the franchise and all that. So like, obviously, you wouldn't want to pass up the opportunity. But no, no, this is almost guaranteed to be a billion dollar film. 
you, oh my god, is Craig's last? Well, yeah, film? I mean, and then the last um, two have it, already. Uh, I think like I think they. Skyfall made a billion. I think Spectre was just like a couple thousand shy. Just shy. Yeah, it. So yeah, it like, yeah. It was basically billion dollar. Um, sure. Danny Boyle does this, a guaranteed billion dollar film, and it, it turns out to be good. Right. Everyone in Hollywood's gonna say, "Come make a movie for us." Like he can, yeah. he can pretty much make. <laughs> well, he's all he's Danny Boyle. Well, yeah, he's he can already, make whatever he's already he got wants. that, but he hasn't had like a, a big movie in a while. And I feel like, yeah, sure. If he wants to, any project he wants to get greenlit could be greenlit of any budget size. I and mean, you know what I mean, like because yeah, that's a good not so point, much because not I, so much that Danny Boyle is struggling to get movies made. It's just that like he can do. He has like carte blanche if he can sort of do. This. So I feel like it would be stupid to do the Beatles movie over the Bond film, just right. career wise. I don't know. Well, in 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 for prestige factor, I I don't know what the story is or anything like that, but I mean. It, I, I feel like this Bond film helmed by Danny Boyle, written by John Hodge, starring Daniel Craig and whoever the hell else they get in there. If it is as quality of a film as I would hope it would be from Danny Boyle, mm-hmm. could we be a potential award speculation? I mean, obviously, if the song is good enough, we'll, it'll get a Best Original Song nomination. I'll probably win, but if, um, if, if, <laughs> if Sam Smith can win. Um, well, ah. right. I mean, we'll say that the the award is basically in Bond 25's hands for best original yeah. song, unless it's like Alicia Keys and Jack White. <laughs> but, um, but, but that's the thing, you know, you've got a, you've got a talent like, um, Danny Boyle and John Hodge on here. We saw what happened with Skyfall. That got several Oscar nominations. Roger Deakins, I yep. believe, was nom- was he nominated? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was yeah, snubbed. which, absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. Um, you know, could we be looking at potential Oscar nominations for the film with this quality talent behind I it? I definitely that, that, that actually brings it nice full circle back to what I, where I was going with this before. Um, with the prestige, with the prestige thing, well, I think right, this, the, right. Danny Boyle doesn't have prestige. Well, he he has prestige to like film going audiences, but the general public is not like oh Danny Boyle. You know what I mean? Right. But to to, to the awards people, to the like like those people, like the critics. That's a name with prestige, and so it. Well, it's coming out in November as well. well perfect award bo- season. It bodes timing. well for the film. That I mean, maybe like it, it, we probably won't get a best picture nomination. Uh, but, w- well, unless it's just like blows everything out of the right, water. Unless I mean, it's like, like the I best like Bond film we've of ever really, seen. Really great. Blockbusters don't get nominated, even if they are right, like, better no. than some of the. But but here's the. You know, I, I will pitches. play devil's advocate here just a little bit yeah. because the way. The, things are starting to change from the academy. We're starting to see more mainstream films kind of integrated into that is true. You're right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the academy. You know, because they brought a bunch of new members in, and something like this. It's got Danny Boyle attached to it, and it is a a big tentpole film. Um, if the quality yeah, is there, the ratings are down for the Oscars, so they could exactly. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, something could align here where we could be looking. I mean, this is all speculation. We of have course, no idea. Yeah. We don't even know the story. So the story could be just like absolutely ridiculous bond it could be a great bond film but maybe not like an oscar worthy film but i but that's another thing right like like, why do you get danny boyle if you're not doing like a serious movie you know what i mean not that he's like oh i agree yeah uh, yeah yeah. when i say serious i don't mean like tone i just mean in like like you know a film you know with a capital s yeah if you're not serious about the quality of this movie then why are you getting a talent like yeah yeah i will i i know i i just kind of want to wrap this segment up real quick i know your thoughts on um, Danny Boyle as a potential front runner, yeah. but just so we both are able to give our thoughts out, out there, just thoughts across the board that Danny Boyle could be uh, directing the next Bond film. What are you? How are you feeling about this? Like odds? Well, okay. Well, first of all, odds, but then also like as a as a creative choice, do you like this I choice? I mean, I know it's choice. pretty. Yeah. It's been made pretty evident by this, but I just want to get like one last concrete. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I. Uh, I think the odds are really good, um, just based on the specificity of getting John Hodges to do the script. Like, that that feels a little too weird to make up. Like, right? I mean, right. I feel it's convenient because they worked together before, but I, it just sounds like a really strange thing to say, like to make up. Sure. Um, yeah. Or to get wrong, you know what I mean? Um, right. It's not like they said long time. Like a, a long time collaborator is working with Danny Boyle to write this. That that sounds like fake. But you get John yeah, Hodges. Right, like, right. No, no. Oh, John Hodge. Sorry, I didn't say Hodges. John Hodge. Well, and these it are, sounds so specific, and it's so like I think the odds are really, really good. 
Um, right. And and this is information coming from like Hollywood insiders and Bond insiders if you're looking at Bimig Boye. So and yes, I feel like yeah, he's yeah. And very trustworthy. People are running source. with the story like they, they, they people didn't really run with the um uh, what do you call it story? Um uh Jan Demange or or uh, Denis Villeneuve. Uh most of the Jan Demange right? Like, people didn't really you know what I mean? Well, even Christopher Nolan, you could, you could. I mean, those were those were like those were like big flashy names, right? Like, and it was sort of people people, people yeah. ran with the story because you have to. But sure, this one I feel like yeah, it's being reported as news rather than speculation, which is interesting. Yes, agree. Uh, which agreed. means these people have enough faith in their sources that they're they're pretty confident to run it that way. So yeah, great yep. odds. Um, and in terms of like how I feel about it, I guess. I love this idea. I've, like I said before, I, sure. I really wanted to see him do one for a while. Um, mm-hmm. It fits with the whole like sort of trend where they've been really going for British talent. Um, yeah, yeah, and getting like act- and like like really banking on the 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 prestige of the brand a bit more. Um, yeah, this would be good. This would be this is really really good. I think they. Um, I like uh, Spectre, but it was a bit of a, like a lukewarm reception. I think they're mm-hmm. really. They really want another reason why they want someone with a name rather than Jan Demage. You know what I mean? I think is because oh, yeah, they, for sure, for after sure. after like the sort of the tepid response to Spectre, that's like we need to like win people back because the same thing happened. Like I mean, like Quantum Solace got a far worse reaction than Spectre did, but mm-hmm. after that, it, like it was like people were riding high. People were like Bond is like a blockbuster, and then after Casino Royale, and then Quantum Solace is like oh, and then. So yeah, then, it's like every time they mess up, they happens, do and something like, to oh fix my god, it. Bond's yeah. a billion dollar franchise, and then Spectre was like a little. It still made a lot of money, but it wasn't like, you know, the film of that winter. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I think they're really hoping for like this next one has to be like you know Bond, and so getting yeah. someone with a proven talent like this is a good start, and uh, yeah, and getting someone who will make the, make a film that is his own, not. Sure. Which is so... Uh, that's one of my favorite things about the Bond franchise in terms of, like, I guess, Hollywood films is that... Because we're always talking about with Marvel and all that, like, oh, they never really like their film... Like, the filmmaker... Like, like they've started to get a bit better, but for a while there was sort of, like, the Marvel assembly line, you know what I mean? Like, all the films were kind of just the same. Oh, sure, yeah. And yeah. Um, and even that still, to, to an extent, is true. They've gotten a bit better with, like, um, letting uh, Taika Waititi do his own thing and all that. But, mm-hmm. um, and letting Ryan Coogler do his own thing. But, um, we're always talking about with these Hollywood films, like, oh, they're all just kind of guns for hire. But the the Bond films as of late have been so good about, like, like Sam Mendes, just do your thing. And, yeah, like, it, like, it felt like a Sam Mendes yeah, film. Yeah, and he you really, know what I'm saying? Like, 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 he bumped up, like, he brought like, into the 21st century in terms of, like, filmmaking sensibilities. Like, he really. Yeah, uh, change the way we think about Bond films now. Bond films. Uh, we're talking about a Bond film for an Academy Award, which is uh, would have been absurd. Even even after Casino Royale came out, that would have been an absurd thing to discuss. Oh, for sure. And, yeah, and, and we love Casino Royale. Oh, yeah. but there's no way that movie would ever. Not be in nominated. that climate. Not like not, not in the way like no. just like yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. But now we're looking at Oscar winning directors and wait like mm-hmm. yeah the fact that the, the the front runners are Christopher Nolan um uh who has just like made a series of like fantastic um like prestige films and then um Denis Villeneuve who was up for an academy award last year and made one of the last uh, the year before last sorry and then last year made like Blade Runner and the fact that we're talking about this kind of like these kind of auteurs is mm-hmm. mind-boggling so the, yeah I think the franchise has, oh, so yeah, really yeah, has yeah. to sort of keep it uh keep its pace up going forward now and I think Danny Boyle falls in line with that, like sort of that new sensibility. So, sure, yeah. sure, yeah. For myself, just real quickly, I will say, I don't know percentage wise, but I think it's pretty damn accurate that we'll be looking at a Danny Boyle, John Hodge, Bond twenty five film. Um, and as for how I feel about it, I like it. I think it's a great choice. I think. Danny Boyle, great British talent. That's the thing I like about it, too. It's British talent making a British icon um, come to the big screen for the 25th time. Yeah. I mean, that's that's incredible stuff there. But um, my only reservation 
is that I hope his style doesn't get in the way of the film. Because there's been... I mean, Danny Boyle has a very distinct style. And I'm not saying that it, it, it won't work with the film. He could find a way for it to work. I just don't want it to be over-the-top Danny Boyle-isms to the extreme. Like, I don't want shots of, like, like Dutch angled shots zooming in on, like, a, a siren or something like that. You know what I I'm saying? I kind of wouldn't like, just, mind that. I think that would actually be kind of well, cool. Throw in, like, <laughs> one or two, because it's obviously what Danny Boyle does best, but I don't want the most Danny Boyle-isms are ever conceived on film in a, in a Bond film. It just it, I feel like it would take away from the fact that it's a Bond film, and and that's that's kind of how I look at this. Make it a good James Bond film first, then add your flavor to it. I mean, we're gonna get flavor no matter what because this is Danny Boyle. He's got a very distinct style. He's got a very distinct direction and clearly a distinct vision for the project. But I don't want that to get in the yeah. way of creating a good Bond film. That is my only that's reservation. I think, Outside, I, of- yeah, I think a good comparison for what you're saying is like. Um, um, what J.J. Abrams did when he did The Force Awakens. Like, yes. make, make a good film that feels, like, related to the other films in the series. Yes. And don't, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. Now that you put it like that, yes. But, I, I, yeah, I want to see his touch, but I don't, yeah, I don't want it to be, like, so alien excessive. from the rest of the series in terms of aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's, that's a great point with the J.J. Abrams, because even, even though The Force Awakens felt like a J.J. Abrams film, it it felt like, oh, I'm sorry, even yeah. though it felt like a Star Wars film, it was distinctly J.J. Abrams through the camera movements and stuff like that. I just don't want him to overdo it with his camera movements and such. But um, yeah, but yeah I, I think this is great news. I Last, just really, really <laughs> quick response. When do you think we're going to get a, um, get a concrete answer, an announcement from Eon about Danny Boyle taking over as director? You said there was like the, the, the script is going to be done in like two months? Yeah, yeah, like a, a few months or something so, like that. So when do you, when do you think I'm we get an announcement? March, beginning of the summer then, I guess. Like, maybe... Um, May or June. Yeah, I'd say end of May, early June is when we might be looking at one. Yeah. Hopefully. Actually, hopefully. this is... If they don't have... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, if they don't... If, if it's not there by then... We might be looking at them pushing the film back, but that's just that's just what I'm thinking. And is it like um this is like a complete quick little aside since this is the end of the segment? Um, sure. Is, do you think? Do you have like any? Are you tapping anyone for any like positions? If the if they, if like any like a cinematographer or anything like that? Well, like, I I have here? to go. I I would have to go look at who Danny Boyle frequently looks at or works with Mm -hmm. for his uh, cinematographer. But if we're we're just talking cinematographers in general, someone who um, doesn't – someone who isn't a frequent collaborator of Danny Boyle – this would, be, this would be wild, but I, I, I really hope this guy shoots a Bond film, whether it's for Danny Boyle or someone else down the road. Um, Emmanuel Lubezki. Ooh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's... He'd, he'd give it a nice uh, feel that would feel, you know, um, inherently um, Lubezki, but, uh, you know, he can he can tailor his style to different things. I feel like we wouldn't get him as a as a DP unless we were getting, like, an Alfonso Cuar- Cuaron-directed <laughs> um, Bond film, which... Just me saying that, I am all in on that. <laughs> that is fucking awesome. Let's see that one. Uh, I, I I don't know. Yeah. I, what, what do you? Any positions that you would you would say? Um. Uh, yeah. I, I honestly. I. I, don't, I shouldn't have asked this question because I, I don't know who Danny Boyle frequently works with. Um. Mm-hmm. Not that that really means anything because. Um. You can get anyone really. Um. I don't know. It would be really cliche if I said like, like, like Hoyt Van Hoytima or like um, well, Roger Deakins to like, come back because I really like. Yeah, I, I like Hoyt Van Hoytima. Yeah, I liked both of them, and I think um, getting either one back would just be a dream because I think those are the two sure. most like gorgeous Bond films. Um, um, I looked it up real quickly. Uh, um, Boyle's frequent uh, cinematographer is Anthony Dodd Mantle. He's done Slumdog Millionaire, Transpotting to. Rush, the Ron Howard Ooh. film, which was fucking gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've never seen that film, highly recommend it. Uh, 127 hours. So a lot of Danny Boyle films. I wonder if he shot Steve Jobs because that movie looked damn good. He was... Um, um, hmm. 
Okay, yeah, no, then, well, then if, if he, he did, dr- uh, he did, he did Dread, he did In the Heart of the Sea, Ooh. which that movie was not that great, but it looks great. I would be okay with this guy, yeah. Anthony Dodd Mantle. I would be a hundred percent okay if he, um, if he, uh, did the camera work for the film. Yeah, I'm very okay with it, actually. Yeah, I, yeah. I it sounds like this is his go to guy, so it sounds like if it's Danny Boyle, it's almost definitely going to be this guy. Probably will be yeah. him, and I think we could be looking at a very. Very pretty looking film. Absolutely. So. Oh, good. This act, that makes oh, me very happy. Right. Yeah, well, the second you said uh, Rush, I was like, ooh. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. Well, even in the heart of the sea, it looks really, I think really I was just distra- good. In that film, I'm just distracted by some of the like the visual effects, which isn't oh really yeah, yeah, the, the sure. cinematographer's fault. It's just like I think that this sort of took like I don't know, distracted me a little bit, but. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Well, with that, guys, that closes out Tomorrow Never Lies. Hopefully you got enough Bond news, and hopefully you got enough uh, Danny Boyle news. Um, Be sure to let us know your thoughts on Danny Boyle potentially helming Bond 25. Do you like this choice? Was there someone else you you would rather see? Um, And then also let us know the likelihood that this will happen. Be sure to let us know in the comment section of wherever you are listening to this. And with that, we move on to Q Branch, the second where we discuss all things not related to the film. So Bond comics, Bond novels, uh, concert events, all that good stuff. Anything that isn't directly tied into the films is where we discuss it in in Q Branch. And, of course, I could talk about Q Branch, but let's give Brody a chance Ooh. to talk about some stuff. So, Brody, what do we got going on in Q Branch? Um, we've basically just got a little rundown, essentially, of um, of the books that are coming out, either like reprints or new books or comic books we're just basically going to go through at what's coming out um in chronological order and sure yeah uh real quickly i just do want to mention that this go ahead yeah 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 for sure i i just do want to mention that this list was compiled by jack lugo over at james bond radio so thank you to him for you can you can head on over to james bond radio and check out uh the the list that he compiled he did a great job Mm -hmm. of putting everything there for us uh and if you don't uh, follow James Bond Radio or, or listen to James Bond Radio. Highly recommend it. They're on top of their shit and they're great over yeah. there. That was not a plug. I am not being asked <laughs> to do that. I don't personally know the guys. I just respect what they do and they do a good job at it. So absolutely. All right. So we we'll just we'll just kick it off. Then there is a um, a Colonel Sun reprint that's uh, coming out March sixth. So actually, that just came out. So that's. Yeah, it's a, uh, that yeah. is already available. So if you're listening and you want to read Colonel Sun for the first time or d- again, then you can go find a reprint. Um, I really love Colonel Sun. It's probably one of the better non-Fleming Bond books. Uh, it was written right after Fleming died, so it's kind of like it's of the time mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and, and in fact, uh, a, a, like an entire chunk of that book was verbatim Inspector. <laughs> um, no, really. Yeah. Basically, Blofeld's entire speech about watching a man get his eyes, like, punched in. Um, oh, That was yes, all yeah. verbatim, almost, from Colonel Sun. So I was, like, sitting there in the theater, and then he starts talking about, like, um, have you ever watched a man's, like, the life leave a man's eyes? And, like, James and I recently, I was like, was like holy shit, this is, like, the speech. But, um, yeah, really, really, I mean, that's one of the better little monologues in the movie and it's one of the better little moments in the book. Um, sure. Yeah. So definitely check that one out if you have not. Uh, and then next coming up on uh, March 13th, so that's a couple days from now, um, is Casino Royale, the graphic novel, which uh, is Ooh. brought to us by our friends at Dynamite Entertainment who have, they've been doing a bunch of really, really cool uh, 007 Great stuff over like, there. graphic novels. Yeah. Some re- we've talked about them before on the show. Uh, just a lot of really, really cool stuff. And this yeah. is their first adaption of a Fleming book. And so, and like, it's actually interesting because, um, the, like, they used to do these comic strips for the books back in the day, um, in the Daily Express. And so this is kind of, uh, a similar concept, except this is, uh, it's, it's an original work. It's not a reprinting of these, of those original strips. Um, and it, uh, it featured, it's featuring artwork by, um, Dennis, Calero, I don't know. I'm guessing that's how you say his name, but um, I think you're, I think you're pretty accurate on that one. Yeah, and so this, this would be really cool, um, just to sort of see, because when you're reading the book, obviously you picture things a certain way, um, and everyone has a different interpretation of what the like what what the descriptions look like, um, 
But so it would be really cool for like the, for like the first time to see someone draw out what they saw when they read it and sort of present it in a visual sense. I, I don't know. I'm really excited. I love this kind of stuff. Um, like a, a good little sure. like companion for the book. Um, yeah. Well, and and for someone like me, I know it's it's like sacrilege for me to say this, but I I I'm not a huge um, novelist guy. I I don't really like to read mm-hmm. a whole lot, so I haven't gotten around to reading all of the James Bond novels. I've read some of the more recent ones, not some of the classic Fleming ones, which I know, sacrilege, <laughs> I'm saying that on a James Bond podcast for crying out loud, oh, but this could be a great opportunity for me to dive into the Casino Royale book through this graphic novel. I don't know how um, you know similar it will be to the Fleming book, but you know, Presumably, it'll cut some stuff out, Presum- but it'll be probably, sure, it'll probably follow right. it pretty strictly, I'm, I'm imagining, anyway. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and so this is something that definitely entices me, and I, I'll definitely be picking that up. And actually, we'll probably do a review on this and maybe like a future episode after I've uh, completed yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, it'll be... Yeah, no, it'll be cool. It, it'll be a good gateway into the books if people have not read them, because... Yeah, for sure. They are, for sure. I mean, they're short books. They're not that long, but they are... like They're, they're older, so they, in a sense, that's daunting um, to read something that was written half a decade, like half a century ago. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I mean, anyway, so that, that, that sounds like it'll, it'll be pretty good. Um, and then we have some kind of hero coming to paperback edition on March 15th, a couple days after that. Um, and so it's written by Matthew Field and AJ. I don't know. I should have read this name before I, we started. Uh, sh- sh- Shoutery or something like that. Sh- yeah. yeah. I don't know what he said. Um, <laughs> and so it's essentially a comprehensive overview of the Bond film franchise for Bond fans to pour over. Um, you can either read the book from start to finish, or you can use it as a little companion while you watch the films. Um, uh, yeah, so that actually sounds pretty interesting. It's just like, a, am guessing, a, a little behind-the-scenes thing that you can flip through and just see how they made the film, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. I haven't, I, I haven't yeah, actually well, read this book, I, so... <laughs> right, I, I think it's already out. This is just like the paperback yeah. edition, but um, but yeah, I mean, from what uh, Jack is saying over on um, uh, James Bond Radio, I mean, he he's he's praised the book uh, very much. So uh, he says, you know, a nice companion piece for for the films and stuff like that. So if you want, like, kind of like a you know companion piece that you can read about and then watch the films and kind of go back and forth between the two, if you're into that sort of thing, um, this might be something that you. Are interested in checking yeah, out? Absolutely. It sounds. It sounds a lot like um, what I used to do when I when I'd watch them as a kid. I'd always go and watch the movie, and then I'd watch the um, the little documentaries they had on the on the uh, the the DVD. Sure. It's, yeah. 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 And like, it's always really. It always. I don't know. I've always found that more um, made the film more interesting when you sort of saw how they made it, and so yeah, that sounds yeah. like it should be good. Uh, and then we coming up after that. This one doesn't have a date, but uh, there's a a reprint of Casino Royale uh, in anticipation of Anthony Horowitz's second Bond continuation novel, uh, Vintage, which is the publisher, uh, have reprinted a paperback edition of the original Fleming classic with a new introduction penned by Horowitz himself. Um, this was publicized a little while ago on uh, in Fleming's website, and um, along with the announcement of Horowitz's new novel. Uh, but yeah, there, there's like really... Not too much information out on that other than that. Like a lot of Casino Royale. There's a lot of Casino Royale going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it. Oh yeah, go ahead. I I think it has. No, I was just gonna say. I think it has to do with the fact that the next book we're gonna talk about is coming out this May. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Well, actually, maybe this is maybe this is all coordinated. Getting. getting, I uh, I have a feeling. Getting Casino Royale into people's minds because on nothing wrong with nothing wrong with that. But then on May 31st, um, Horowitz's new continuation novel comes out, which is Forever in a Day. And it is essentially a prequel to Casino Royale, if I'm uh, be- if I'm allowed to believe that is true, um, mm-hmm. which is an interesting idea. Um, yeah, what do you think of that, Griffin? Well, I I mean, while I don't think a prequel is necessary, I'm very intrigued because it will um, use some of uh, Fleming's original material, which anytime they do that you automatically pique my interest as far as like novels go, even though I haven't read really too many of the Fleming stuff, but it's, it's the man who created James Bond 
anytime you use some of his original material, I'm definitely my ears perk up. So yeah. um, apparently the you know from what uh, Jack is saying, the novel takes a deep dive into the birth of which a legend, is like the, which is kind the of the worst thing they could have said. Right? Like, I, I, it's, oh. it's really interesting because Casino Royale is the prequel to Bond becoming Bond. So it's like this is the prequel to the prequel. So I, it's, it, I'm really fascinated as to how they're going to pull this off. I mean, it, it says right here, it's set in the French Riviera. Yeah. Horowitz's new novel explores a period of time in Bond's history we've all been I curious wasn't. about. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, you know, some fans I'm have not, been. I'm you a know, huge what? Bond fan, and uh, I, I've never ever once been. Oh man, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I get it. I understand your concerns. Yeah. I am not, this, you, you know, know chomping at like? the bit for like, this novel, but this sounds like. Solo, a Star Wars <laughs> story, but for Bond, and I, I couldn't be less interested in finding out how Bond, why Bond says Bond James Bond, or like any of that crap. Like, right, I, right. I, I don't know. Birth of a Legend makes it sound like really lame and cheesy, but I like Horowitz yeah, as no, a writer. I, I get it. It's, he's a, he's a good, competent writer, and also, um, going back to the Fleming material thing. I don't yeah. know because he previously in uh, Trigger Mortis he also used Fleming material, but that was like for a TV show that he was developing that he never ended up like making, um, right? And so they just incorporated that into the the opening chapters. But uh-huh. uh, this I, I, when he says original material, it makes me think of like when they made the Hobbit movies. And they said like, <laughs> using all of <laughs> they Tolkien's used Jackson's material, notes. or I'm sorry, Tolkien's notes. Yeah, yeah. and it's like. That, I feel like that's what they're talking about. I think they're saying we're going to go back, and you, when we say Fleming material, we mean Fleming wrote some notes about what Bond was doing before Casino Royale, and now, or like just like little tidbits of his history. Because like we've already we've already always gotten snippets of Bond's past in the books. Like um, in Casino Royale, he sort of explains. Yeah, they do the flashback to he, his he sort of how he became how, yeah, double O. How he yeah. became double O, and then you have like little moments where he'll reference a previous mission or stuff like that, um, or yeah. like his childhood, um, which they really like sort of go uh, go into a little bit. Um, yeah. Later on, like obviously in Majesties, and then in um, uh, which one? I th- I'm pretty sure they go over it in You Only Live Twice as well, but um. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we we've already gotten like the the essentials of Bond's um life. And I don't know what else we need to know. Like I don't know what other, what other mysterious story that we that he never never references again ever because it might, it, you know, for as important as the story seems to be, he's never going to talk about it ever again. Um sure. So sure. It just sort of seems strange like i don't know it's the unspoken origin yeah. of the legend of the british spy it's, yeah, I it's know, like it's like we're going with that but like, like, it's not like we can go back and show like like even with the han solo movie they're going to show like this lover that scorned him or something right well, sure, we've already seen yeah. the, the lover that scorned bond that was vespa in casino royale like yeah it's that that's that's the kind of thing that makes me a little like what tell, is yeah. because cuz yeah it's like casino royale is for all intents and purposes a prequel to how James Bond became James Bond. I mean, it's not... It's not designed it's, to be that, but that's the, that's no, the way it's it not. Is. It's just yeah. it's just the way it is because of who he is in the sequential books and the sequential movies, um, and who he was in Casino Royale. So we're taking that a step further back. It almost just feels like like unnecessary, really. Like yeah. I don't need to know any of that. But but I mean, all all that aside, if it's a good book, it's a good book, and I'm definitely I probably will read this one, and I don't usually read. So <laughs> oh yeah, no, for sure, I'll definitely read it. I definitely I, I definitely have. I'll give the benefit of the, of the doubt to Horowitz because he is a good writer, and I do trust him sure. um, as a creative person. But yeah, a little bit, a little bit like skeptical on why he chose to. Maybe he had a really good idea. Who knows? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, on, w- w- we'll see May thirty first. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and then um, the next book on this little list, uh, since we're just gonna go one by one, uh, is the Double sure. Seven Diaries, uh, filming Live and Let Die by Roger Moore. And so this is Roger Moore's last. Uh, well, not his last book, but this is like a reprint of his like uh, memoir. Sorry, I got that mixed up with the other one he made. Uh, yeah, this is a reprint of Roger Moore's memoir that he wrote uh, while shooting uh, Live and Let Die, and it's coming out June 1st. And um, yeah, so I mean, there's not much to say about this. It's a book that you can already 
fine, I guess. But uh, this is a, a, a reprint, obviously, following his death. Um, so if you're interested, because Roger Moore's a really funny guy. He's actually he's a really um, he's a really good writer. If you've never read any of his of his books, he's he's just a just as affable as he is in person in his books. Mm-hmm. And so if you're mm-hmm. interested in reading like a sort of well, what I'm sure is to be a, a, a witty retelling of the making of Live and Let Die, then be sure to check that out. Um, and also check, what was the name of his last book? What was the name of that? I'm trying to remember. It was, I thought, I thought it was something 007 Diaries. Like there was, there's been multiple 007 Diaries, right? Or am I wrong? Um, no, I don't think that, maybe, uh, but like. I, I, I think I'm wrong on that. Oh, let me look it up. Um, yeah, I'm just wrong. Well, anyway, check out Roger Moore's last book as well, since I'm going to, I'll do a little plug right there. Um, it made me weep. <laughs> is it is it my world on is bond is my bond? My world is or my is bond? It bond? That, that was um, before that one. Um, uh, bond on bond. I think was it bond on bond. I don't know, man. I'm looking for the. <laughs> <laughs> it's um. I I think it was no. I I uh, I don't even know, man. Yeah, I, I mean it's it'll. I think it was. Oh, that's right. It was. Um. It was. It was the French title. It was like. Um. Like. Ah. Uh, Beno. I don't know how to say it, but um, that one. Okay. That was his last yeah. book, and it, it it made me cry because it was Roger Moore's last book. He didn't realize oh, yeah. it, but it kind yeah. of feels like it has a nice bit of finality to it. Um. Yeah. So I, I definitely check that out because he is a, a wonderful writer, a wonderful storyteller. Um. And if you love. Bond. Even if you don't love Roger Moore, which shame on you, but even if you don't, it's worth reading. He's he's he had a close relationship uh, to the franchise, so yeah. Anyway, so that's a completely oh uh, Arbino, yes, or uh, Arbino, or something no, like that. yeah, yeah, something like that. I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it, but that's yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So maybe that's Double Seven Diaries and also um Al- Albino. Albino. I don't know how to say it. I'm going to stop embarrassing myself. I'm sorry if you're French. Uh, yeah, sorry. yeah. <laughs> I'm just butchering your language. Um, beautiful language, <laughs> but I just cannot speak it. Um, and now the next one we've got is Kill Chain, which is another graphic novel from Dynamite Entertainment, and that's coming out April 24th. And so uh, a little bit about Kill Chain. The creative team who worked on Hammerhead, uh, Andy Diggle and Luca... Uh, oh, God, why is everyone... A- Casa Languida. Yeah, there we go, that one. Um, I have, like, dyslexia when it comes to names, so it, like, just messes okay. me up. Um, okay. They're reuniting uh, for this installment of the James Bond graphic novels. Uh, this story features the return of Smirsh, which, uh, if you're not familiar with what Smirsh is, Smirsh was a an organization within the Russian government that Ian Fleming frequently referenced um, in his earlier Bond books. Basically, until he created Spectre, that was what they, that's what they function as. The OG Spectre. OG Spectre, which was like, yeah, it was basically just, <laughs> um, they just ran operations, counter, counterintelligence operations for the Russian government. Uh, so it's kind of cool yeah. that they're going back and using Smirsh because no one talks about Smirsh. Like, literally no right. one. Right. Well, and, so. and like we say, literally every time we get to Q Branch, Dynamite has been dynamite with the graphic yeah. novels. Like, so, and I read, um, Hammerhead mm-hmm. and the the other one that they did is phenomenal. Is so good. Like, um, I, I I loved every bit of it. So if you haven't read any of those, highly recommend. It. So just, I'm definitely looking forward to this. They do one, such a definitely. good job of going back and like taking things, like taking obscure. They're really written for fans, I guess, because like, they take they'll take like things that were just like in the books, right. or like just the aesthetic of the books and sort of contemporize it. And it's just. It's just so right. much fun. They're, they're so good. Well, and, and the the body that the, the series body, that they yes, have yeah, yeah, going yeah. on right now, that's the the six issue series. I've I've read a few of them. And they're uh-huh. Excellent. Um. So like they just keep coming with with all of this stuff, and um, it's kind of nuts. I'm a little yeah. more r- right. Yeah, I, I'm a little more partial to the graphic novels just because I think that that's that's a format that suits Bond well. Not that the comics don't. The comics are fine. The comics are great. It's just um. You can do a little bit more long form stuff in a graphic novel yeah. without it being so choppy. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. No, for sure. Yeah, and so like, if you want to see more about Smirsh, then you should check out um, Kill Chain. And if you if you don't know what Smirsh is, you should go read literally like like go read From Rush with Love or something because <laughs> they're um, they're very very cool, very very interesting, and um, 
Not as not, they, 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 I remember when I was a kid and I first like picked up a Bond book and I saw Smirsh and I thought it was like a printing error. I thought it meant to say Spectre because like in the movie, obviously it was Spectre. Oh right! And so I was, yeah, I was yeah. reading. I was like, "What the fuck is Smirsh?" Like, <laughs> and as I went on, I was like, "Oh wait, okay, this makes sense." Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's really cool. It's cool that they're, they're bringing that back. Um, mm-hmm. And then to the next one we've got on this list, the penultimate book on the list is. Um, <laughs> The Playboy and James Bond, which comes out on March 19th, which I guess this one's actually coming out a little sooner than the, the last couple that we've talked about. Um, yeah, a little kind of, yeah. yeah. March 19th, so that's like this month. Um, and it's Claire Hines, who previously wrote a fan phenomenon, James Bond, which was a collection of academic essays about James Bond fandom, returns with an examination of the cultural constructs that combined to identify the image of James Bond with the Playboy, uh, while also taking a look at how Playboy magazine itself helps promote such an image. Now, this this is like the sort of book I want to read. This is like this is incredible. So, like, um, yeah, yeah, I I because I, I read um I didn't read all of Fan Phenomenon, but I've read several of the essays that are featured in that one, and I even like my freshman year, I wrote a paper about. James Bond because I, I, they gave me an opportunity to write something and I was like I'm gonna write about Bond and right, I right. referenced that book and so it's, a, it's kind of like I'm just like getting hit with nostalgia right now I'm like going back it's like, there's some really really <laughs> cool stuff like I mean one of my favorite things to do is like to like I'm overly analytical so I love that sort of thing and I don't know this is this is just a really really cool like it's cool that I think this is coming at an important time because I think Going right, back to yeah. like um, what we were talking about with uh, the you know Bond being an, an, an award contender and all that sort of thing, um, uh-huh. one of the big things that the th- this year's Academy Awards was Me Too and all that sort of thing, and people have been sort of questioning where does James Bond exist in a Me Too, like a post Me Too world, in the same way that they were questioning where does Bond where does Bond exist in a post Cold War world and all this sort of thing, uh, because Bond sure. is such a a product of his environment, a product of his time, and um, I don't know. You you know what I mean? So like, yeah, no, yeah, I definitely. Where, where does, it's a very relevant, topical, and like, yeah. it, it's something that like you know if you're if you're into this and you're into like the academia behind Bond and all that stuff like that, this is like a must read. Essentially. Oh, for sure. I know, but not even. I think it's even if no one reads this book, I think um, which would be a shame, but. Even well, if, I I think there will be a lot of people. Well, for who sure. Read but this. even if, even if no one does, I think um, as long as I, I think it's an important book, just because Bond as a series, as long as the broccoli's read it, it's 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 we're good because a Bond as a series kind of needs to lean into this rather than yeah, avoid yeah. it. You know what I mean? Like we can't just pretend that Bond isn't a serial like womanizer who can be a little... His behavior towards women has in the past been a little, you know, a bit of an issue. Um, yeah. Rather than, like, la la la, pretending that's not happening, um, you risk... If you do that, you risk making the series a relic. You know what I mean? And so... Oh, sure, yeah. You, it becomes antiquated. It becomes kind of stigmatized as being like, oh, that series. It's the series with the, the guy who molests people. You know what I mean? Um mm-hmm. But if you lean into it and you say, "Yeah, this is a this is something that was a part of Bond's identity, is part of Bond's identity," we're going to look at this. We're not going to defend it. We're just going to look at it, sort of see where it, like the culture it came out of and how it can evolve. I think that's the that's how Bond has re- remained relevant for all these years. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Bond stopped smoking in the nineties because no one fucking smoked anymore. Like, you know what I mean? And it's mm-hmm. not, like, people like look at that and say, like, "Oh, it's just like kowtowing to the political movements of the time or whatever." But I think it's Bond should reflect the time he's in. And if if he st- if to this day Bond went around smoking like cottons a day and like literally smacking women on the ass, no one would watch these films. They wouldn't make oh, a billion absolutely dollars. Absolutely not. So no. it's like. I don't know. I think this is an important thing um, for the series. is an important moment in in uh, entertainment, and I think Bond involving itself in the conversation in any way is really beneficial for the series. So this is I'm really really excited about this. If you can't tell, this is a really really sure, cool sure. Um, 
I'm glad someone's doing it anyway. I'm glad someone's going. Well, maybe we'll have Brody do a uh, an overview of this one Absolutely. once he reads it. Yeah, and then anyway, so now now that I've uh, sort of geeked out on that book for a little bit, um, we've got our final book on the list, which is Sh- now this is my <laughs> favorite one that's coming out. <laughs> it's, uh, no, I don't even want to think about this book today. I, I'm I am sick to my so stomach. excited Just, about this book um, right now. Um, shaken. Drinking with James Bond and Ian Fleming, which is another way of saying drinking yourself into a coma. Um, <laughs> this is the official cocktail book. And this comes out October 2nd, so this is right, right in time for, like, you know, Halloween. Um, Good stuff. So, yeah, this will be the, the first officially authorized guide to the cocktails and alcoholic beverages of the novels. Featuring ex- excerpts from Ian Fleming's novels, this should be a treat for those of you who desire to replicate and emulate the Bond lifestyle. This is actually really cool because yes. Ian Fleming... We were talking about this also, like, last year at some point, I was like, man, you know, I really want to I really want to have a Vesper right? or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But it's like, I feel like you can't go into just, like, your average bar and be like, I'll take a Vesper. They'll look at you like, what the, yeah. what the fuck <laughs> do you want? What is that? A Vesper? Like... And then you have to... Then, then that's when you recite, you recite the, um, like, like the, the entire order. <laughs> yeah, I know. Then, then they think that you're making fun of them. They're like, "Oh, what are you, James yeah, Bond?" And then you're like, "I literally want the drink that Bond has." Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So this is a really cool thing. I, w- I I hope after this they bring out um, the food of the bo- the Bond novels because oh, one yes. of the things, the, one of the best things that I don't think Ian Fleming gets much uh, credit for is he was a travel writer before um, and after. Well, not after because he died finishing a Bond book, but, um, in between books and also before the books, he was a travel writer. He was, I mean, he was a journalist and part of what he did was, um, like travel writing. And so he's really good at describing like locations and, um, food in a way that makes you like, it's not like an, like an, um, an itemized list of things, you know what I mean? Like a lot of a lot of people's descriptions are kind of like, we'll just throw in two things and then that'll describe it, or we'll just give you a whole fucking laundry list of descriptors. Ian Fleming mm-hmm. was so good at you in, in so few like descriptors, making you visualize food and drinks and places, and that's why the books were so like such good escapist entertainment is because you could live a different life reading the book, and so mm-hmm. um, it, it, he describes a lot of really like delicious sounding drinks obviously in this book is going to oh delicious, delicious. Yeah, yes. exactly Elliot yeah. Carver would <laughs> but we had to make one Elliot Carver joke per episode Absolute we have to mandatory um mandatory. We've, got to get, we've got to write a check now um we've got to write like a royalties check um <laughs> just to like you know keep um uh, what's his name Jonathan Price afloat yeah Jonathan um, Price <laughs> but anyway uh, the, uh, the reason I want like a food book next is because the food is oh it's unbelievable I, I can't remember what, what the dish was um in Diamonds of Forever he's eating something on the cruise ship and I it was it legitimately made me hungry I was reading it I stopped reading it <laughs> when I like made food because it was just yeah he's so good at that is that good he really is, is. That and good? so um this is great. This is really, really cool. It's also cool that we're just getting Bond merchandise in general. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, man. Like, like an official Bond merchandise, yeah, exactly. too. Not just like, oh, these like books by people who are like fans of Bond. No, this is like legitimate, like, you know, keep it coming. I'm all about the Bond merch. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so this is really cool. Um, and so that does it for the books. I've prattled Good on stuff. about those for a little bit, but um, and then there's one. So there, there's your summer reading, guys. <laughs> like literally, so many books are coming out in March, some in June, and some in April. Like I think there's only a handful that are coming out the latter half of the year. Yeah. So really, there's Spaced there's out. your summer reading. Yeah, you, 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 once you finish, or you have your work cut out for you in in uh, March. It seems like a lot's coming out this month, but um, yeah, yeah. After that, you can sort of space it out a little bit, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, really dive in. Uh, we got one more story for Q Branch, which is a, a quick little like announcement, I guess, which is that there's a Moonraker concert. Um, cue the music, James Bond in concert, <laughs> um, which they're bringing us the uh, the music of Moonraker with a 100 piece orchestra, uh, and this is for everyone in the UK. Uh, I believe this is in. Um, mm, I'm trying to find the. I th- I had the the concert hall, but I I lost it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> of course, <laughs> I, I think it's like Wycombe Swan in uh, Saint Mary, Saint sure. Mary, no, Saint Mary Street in High Wycombe, 
Wycombe Swan, I guess, is the is the auditorium. Yeah. We'll, we'll have a but, we'll uh, have a link in the description if yeah, you guys yeah. are interested in this. I, this is it's it's not even until January of 2019, but oh it is God. happening. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Of all of I mean of all the Bond movies to do as a concert, Moonraker is a pretty good one. Like Moonraker is a is a good score. Like consider especially considering the conditions that John Barry had to work under, um, because for like for tax reasons they shot Moonraker in France. Um, even like, even the soundstage stuff was all on in France and they recorded the music there um, just because it was cheaper at the time. Um, sure. That's how we got that lovely story of Roger Moore meeting... Um, oh, uh, yes. David Bowie. Um, yes, David yeah. Bowie, yes. And so... Um, yeah, so... It, and also, it's, it's going to be really cool to hear that music in concert because they lost all the original sheet music um in a fire mm-hmm. and so because it was in france and so like they, they lost it in a fire then they didn't have duplicates made because they were overseas and all this sort of thing so it's really hard to find the music for moonraker that's why this, this the, the, i think the soundtrack for it is pretty scarce compared to some of the other ones uh, and, and there right. haven't been as many re-releases and whatnot so this will be really really cool um like legitimately so if you're in the area if you're in the uk or in you know nearby enough where you could justifiably go to the uk um in 2019 do it this is this is a really good score um and obviously just in general if there's any bond score i'd say go but like moonraker especially is a really cool one so yeah i'm sure it'll be a good experience Absolutely. yeah so that, that does it for q branch we're done we did it there we go <laughs> there we go and Obviously, naturally, next we would have our brother from Langley segment, but I think we're going to skip out on that one just for time. And, mm-hmm. and actually, it wasn't even going to be called Brother from Langley this week. It was going to be called Sister from Moscow because ah. we were going to do a quick Red Sparrow discussion. But had to get that in we're running a little. Proud, uh, you were too proud to. I know I was. I just had to mention it, but you know we're already we've, we're already going on for like an hour twenty, yeah. so we might as well just just jump ahead we'll into say, our shaking we'll but say hurt. Red Sparrow. It's pretty good. Go watch it. Like <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah, really, really quickly, I guess if you guys just want our overall thoughts, you should go see it. It's a great espionage thriller. Not necessarily like James Bond, more like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Um, there's a lot of graphic stuff in it, but overall, I think it is... It's one of the better espionage films I've seen as of late. I wouldn't. I don't think I love it as much as you do, but I do. I do. Think it's I, I do. Young. I really, really love this film. Like, I came out of it and I'm like, that's my favorite film of the year so far. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I know, crazy, right? It, well, before just so you guys have context, before that, it used to be Game Night. Game Night was my favorite was film good. of the year. That was fun. That was really good. Yeah. Way off topic, but yes, Game Night is excellent. It was like a, like an Edgar Wright comedy, but like American. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was really, really good. So there you go. You got two movies you can go check out. Um, <laughs> Red Sparrow and Game Night. All right, moving on to Shaken But Heard. We'll try and have uh, somewhat of a a timely discussion here. Um, But essentially, we just, you know, kind of came up with a topic. Doesn't really relate back to anything. I guess it does kind of relate back to Bond 25 in a way. But, um, you know, we... The the Oscars were were just held um, this this past Sunday. And um, obviously, Best Original Score is a category for which you can win an Oscar for. Um, So just based off of that loosely, we were like, (laughs) well, let's think about this. What composers, other than David Arnold, obviously, because he is the GOAT, he is the greatest when it comes to Bond scores, I'll even go out there and say it, I think he's up there with John Barry, maybe even better than John Barry, who knows, I know that's like sacrilege, but anyways, um... So we were thinking, what what compose what composers could score the next Bond film, and if not um, Bond twenty five, just a Bond film in general. So that's the way to tie it back to twenty five. But also mm-hmm. one of the composers I know we're going to talk about was nominated, or actually probably two of the composers that we're going to talk about were nominated for awards this past Sunday. So uh, this is just going to kind of be an open discussion. Hopefully you all enjoy it, and be sure to leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments section below. Brody, yes. How do we want to start this? Do you want to start? You want me to start? Um, well, maybe we should start with the way we were talking about this because originally i think this conversation started when um you suggested um alexander desplat or how you say yes, his name that, he is yeah, yeah because because eventually he was going to come up he is the reason we're actually going we're, we're bringing this up because i 
I, you know, Alexander Desplat, he, he just scored Shape of Water. Phenomenal score. If you haven't listened to it, definitely check it out. But it kind of caused me to do some digging back into his um, scoreography, or I guess you could call it filmography. <laughs> that probably makes more sense. Scoreography. <laughs> I think that's a word, and I'm going word, to keep yeah. it. Yes, yes, yes. No, but um, so I was digging back into his filmography, and I was listening to some stuff, and I was like, wow, this guy really, he just... It's, it doesn't. It's not distinctly Bond, but the more you listen to it, it's like his melodies are very Bond esque. Um, I feel like he could compose for Bond. Um, and then I was listening to some of his tracks on Zero Dark Thirty, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Oh, this is just straight up Bond." <laughs> like there are several tracks on there that is like there's more brass intensive, and it's like it feels like he could be taken out of Goldfinger or something like that. It like it's classic classic bond and um it just and then i started listening to benjamin button and then i started listening to Im- imitation game mm-hmm. some other scores that he's done i'm like this guy would be phenomenal on, on top of the fact that he's an incredible composer and you announce him as the composer for the next bond film i think that's great news um of course yeah. i feel like he would get it like he'd give us a more melodic score that's like reminiscent of the classics um or, or even some of the david arnold stuff you know mm-hmm. um and, and it was and in my biggest, you know, question mark with him was, well, can he use brass? How does he use brass? And you listen to the score for Zero Dark Thirty, and you're like, yeah, that guy can use brass really, really well. So it's just, um, I, I don't know. I think all the pieces are there for Alexander Desplat to create an exceptional Bond score. Um, he's at the top of his game. He's been nominated and won so many Academy Awards in the past couple of years. Yeah. He's really just kind of exploded. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of where this conversation came, stemmed from, and um, I think he'd be a great choice. And I know you feel the same. Oh yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a really, really just um, it, it, I don't know. His scores are very distinct. Like you're not you're not gonna listen to it and go like, oh, like this is film music. You hear it and you you're, you're instantly transported to whatever world he was yeah. trying to take you to. Um, oh, and and real quickly, one of the other reasons why. I thought he'd be great is some of his more piano based tracks. Um, I think there were a few in Benjamin Button, mm-hmm. maybe some in the imitation game and stuff like that. But um, there, there were some of his more piano based um, ones that straight up reminded me of David Arnold's work on the Vesper themes. Ah, and that yeah. whole thing. It was like the sweeping strings and then like the piano that kind of drove it the whole way is like, and then I was listening to that and I was like, Holy crap! They're like this guy, like why has he not been courted for a Bond score yet? Like, jeez, Louise. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, where we ended up going from there when we were discussing is we we sort of ended up just talking about what I guess makes a Bond score, and because I, I feel like there, there are countless um, like like uh, composers in Hollywood who could probably do a pretty good job or at least a decent job. Oh sure, um, yeah, yeah. But I guess like, it's finding someone who can really get to the root of what makes a Bond score a Bond score. And so that's when we, we – because we were initially um, we were talking about uh, um, Despla or whatever. And um, yeah. we ended up – ended up. That was very American. Um, ended up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we ended up at, at – um, so we were just like discussing um, Daniel Pemberton. And I think he would yeah, be – Yeah, that was – yeah. I yeah. think he would be like – like shockingly good, uh, no, 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 yeah. Like, because to the fact- when you brought him up mm-hmm. initially, I was like, "What? What? Like, uh, I don't know about that." But then you you kind of explained it a little bit more. I went back and I listened to the Man from Uncle Score. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Yeah, you know, you're not wrong." Yeah, that's wrong. the thing. I think like um, when we get to like the root of what makes a Bond score a Bond score, everyone's like, they, obviously the answers are like you know a big a big band sound like the jazzy kind of uh, the brass, um, those kinds of sounds. Sure, uh, but I think what gets underrated a little bit um, is how experimental John Barry yeah. was as a composer. Like, I mean, he was he was the man in like the sixties using synth in uh, him, His Majesty's score. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, just, and then, which, by the mm-hmm. way, is one of the albums that Christopher Nolan said he would take with him on a deserted island. Which, uh, yes, like I totally who can fault him? Yeah, who can exactly. fault him? It's one, one of the greats. One of the best, yeah, yeah. Um, you can tell he loves it too because of. Uh, what he asked Hans to do in um, in Inception, but um, yeah, yeah. So like, um, when he gets to like John Barry was just a very he like pushing the boundaries. He even did, he's, he used synth again in um, Living Daylights, and he was always 
Like, even at the time, it was very odd that he was using in a big, like, because this is the 60s. This is, like, um, the, the time of, um, um, like, like the Hitchcock sound, like, what was that, um, Bernard Herman? Um, yeah, Bernard Herman. Like, yeah. that sound was, like, sort of the, the cinematic sound. And then John Barry's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to put, like, guitars in my orchestra. And Yeah, like, he was, yeah, he definitely changed it yeah, up. Dude yeah, dude was, like, really pushing the boundaries. And I feel like... That was my biggest problem with Thomas Newman. Thomas Newman was a little too old school. Well, I, like, I, I wouldn't even say that because I think his Skyfall score was good. The, the biggest problem with his with his scores in general is he didn't utilize the theme um, well, I, the way he should have. Yeah, but I also think like yeah. – um, I mean there, there are different issues that I had with him. But um, – well, in, in his Spectre score was literally just an exact replica of his Skyfall score, which made it very uninspired and, yes, and like he didn't yeah, yeah. It's like he didn't go out of his way to do anything different with Spectre, which is weird because Thomas Newman is one of the greatest composers oh, ever. He's brilliant, yeah. Like he is so distinct. Like you listen to his score for American Beauty and you're like, holy shit, that's one of the greatest scores I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Um Shawshank Redemption, like all that good stuff. Like he's a he's an incredible composer. I just think he kind of missed the mark on Spectre. Oh, no, well, respect to, absolutely. I think everyone will agree that that movie the movie's like score had like a repetition problem and it just yeah, it just felt uninspired. Yeah, but reused with, cues and but stuff. But even with Skyfall, Skyfall's a great score. But it's never yeah. like never as bondy as I want it to be. Like I agree with you. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. And, I, like as much as I like give him credit for you know doing a Thomas Newman Bond score, it just feels like there's there's something not right. with Yeah, it, you and I know? think he, he he just never really leans too far into the brass. He never leans too far into the um the, the guitars. He's just kind of. Keeps it, he plays it safe. It's 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 a very safe orchestral score. It's good. It's a very good right. orchestral score. But it, it, it's um and there are some tracks in well, and in it's, both Skyfall and Spectre that I love. But yeah. um, I'd also say it's distinctly Thomas Newman. It is, but I mean, um, like Thomas Newman's uh, style is very uh, to me anyway. I think, when I think of Thomas Newman, I think of just like a very um, a full orchestra that kind of thing, and. <laughs> Yeah, but there's like distinct there's like distinct sounds to it. Like he's oh. marimba. There's like these like yeah, yeah, yeah. woodwind instruments that are. Very, yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Like it's very like uh, dreamlike in a way. No, for sure. I mean, I'm not saying it's generic. I'm not saying he has a generic orchestral sound. I'm just saying he does. He he sort of leans that way um, of being like more of a like a of a traditional score. And yeah. traditional scores, I don't think. Just because a Bond like score has a full orchestra doesn't mean it's a traditional sound, and I don't think that's what Bond sound is. And so, that was my biggest problem with him. And I think Daniel Pemberton is a great antidote to that because he is just he just every score he does is so different, and he is like these exciting like um, yeah. like not just like compositions, but also the instruments and like there's something very energe- energetic about like the, the scores he does. And yeah, I mean, I go listen to his score for King Arthur: Legend of the Sword. Uh, regardless of what you think of the movie, that <laughs> score is one of the best scores of last year. It was wonderful, yeah. Um, Made the movie, in, for me, it, yeah. Yeah, no, same. It was incredibly experimental. Not very Bond at all. No, but I mean, yeah, of course. He's but composing like, for King Arthur, not you know a modern day spy. So it's a very different kind of approach to it. But just like, but it, going off the experimental of, thing, yeah, yeah. Just, in terms of like, yeah. What, yeah, in terms of his like his um, his ethos when he works. That was totally in line with the Barry mentality for me, and then yeah, Man from Uncle cemented it because Man from Uncle is so Bondian and yet so distinct, and it because it's it's not like I don't think his Bond score would sound exactly like the Man from Uncle, but it would it would definitely no. it would definitely have shades of that sort of sound in it, and I think he could totally nail it. Um, yeah, and I just love I just I want something different and exciting, and I think um, he could definitely do that. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what he he would do, especially because he's one of the the biggest up and comers right now, um, getting a lot more work and kind of getting his name out there. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so who who else we got here? I I know I, his name's going to come up eventually, but um, Hans Zimmer, of course. I mean, we got to talk about him. If Chris, if Chris Nolan's going to do a Bond film, Hans Zimmer's going to compose the score. And I know we have alluded to this in the past, but we were we are both very intrigued and excited about the possibility of what a Hans Zimmer Bond score could sound like. Because it's, you know, we, when we think of Zimmer, we think of um, experimental, like you said, um, using a lot of synths, but then also using predominantly 
low brass and strings. Um, yeah. So he hasn't really delved into Bond territory per se, but knowing you know him and how excellent of a composer he is, there's no doubt in my mind that he could pull it off. Um, it's just what would it sound like? That's just something that I keep going back and forth in my head. It's just like. What on earth would a Zimmer Bond score sound like? And I, I guess I toss it to you. What do you, what do you think about that? Oh, I, I would love that. That's, that's, that sort of ties into what I was saying about um, uh, the, the 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 experimentalness. Oh, that's not a yeah. real word, but like yeah. of Barry Hans Zimmer completely embodies that as well. I think yeah, um, yeah he's just got such an interesting, um, yeah. I guess his just his mentality when it comes to scoring a film is so different and right. Um, it's always fresh and new and exciting. And I just, that's what, I mean, these are little buzzwords I'm using, but I just think it would be really cool to see him tackle that. We've seen, uh, he did, I think, like I said, um, uh, Inception is his most Bondian score and it's awesome. Right. It doesn't sound like it's ripping off Bond. It just definitely sounds inspired by Bond. So, right. Yeah. I don't know. Just interesting. Yeah. No, 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 for sure. I mean, he's, yeah, it's like it's it's one of those things where it's like even though we've never seen we, even though we we've never heard him do something like that before, it's definitely not out of his wheelhouse. Like it's it, we could it would be interesting to see what he's and and you know Chris Nolan is if he if he is you know believed to do one in the future, which it absolutely will happen. Yeah. Um, then he'll definitely bring Hans. And then that will, yeah, we'll he'll bring Hans on, it, and we'll know. get we'll get one hell of a score. All right. Oh, thank um, God. So I just mentioned Hans. So what's a composer? What's another composer that you think? Um. Oh man, it's. I mean, I. I he said he would never do one, but um, Michael Giacchino would be. I was about to bring because him up. of Incredibles. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like the Incredibles. Yeah. I mean, it's. But see, the thing is, it's like he he has gone publicly, gone out there and says like. That is my Bond score. Yeah, like that is like, he like be, it, it wouldn't be fun for me to do one because that's literally it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think and it seems like he's friends with uh, David Arnold too, so he's probably not like. Oh my gosh! If you <laughs> side note here, their interactions on Twitter oh, are priceless. It's amazing. I mean, I, he was just like tweeting out earlier today, like, "Oh, are you still gonna come pick me up at the airport?" And then David Arnold was like, "Oh yeah, I've got a a, a giant like you know." Um, Walkway that 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 streams from the that stems from the private jet to my personal <laughs> apartment or something like it's funny stuff like that. Yeah, but. no. So like, I, if, if, for those reasons, he probably wouldn't end up doing it unless like J.J. Abrams did a Bond film, in which case he was just kind of contractually obligated to do it. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I still think he would do a great Bond score if he let himself because The Incredibles oh, is for sure. an incredible Bond score. And yeah. like a classic old school. That's kind of like if if Pemberton is more of like leaning towards Barry's inclination for experimental scores, then like Giacchino is like leaning towards Barry's inclination for jazz. And so oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it'd just be so cool. So um, yeah, just retro sounding, which would be, I mean, depends on the film it's in, I guess, but it really yeah. does. Yeah. It, it, Cause it I mean, like, really cool. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, here's the thing about Giacchino. It's like, regardless of you know what direction they're taking the um, uh, the franchise in, I still think he could crank out like he could tailor a score towards that movie and still have it be incredible. You know, he's. I mean, he's one of the hottest names uh, in composing right now. Like, he did a Star Wars film. He's done Marvel films. He's done Disney, Pixar, the Incredible stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, he, and and before that, you know, he did Lost, he did the Star Trek movies, like he, I I know a lot of people don't like to make this comparison because they're very different, but I would almost consider him to be like the modern day John Williams, Mm -hmm. and and maybe just because their, their style, like stylistically, they, they kind of are similar, um, but I, you know, I just kind of, in today's day and age, there's no one really utilizing the instruments that John Williams has utilized. And uh, I, I feel like the guy who comes close I- as far as that school of thought is um, Michael Giacchino. So. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I usually talked a bit, a bit about this when we were discussing it over the phone. Um, I don't know if I'd want a John Williams 
like since since John Williams' name came up, since he was invoked. Oh right. Well, um, and, and age aside, obviously, because I think he's way too old. He, w- I, I think he's getting ready to retire. Honestly, by the sounds of it, yeah. I mean, yeah, dude's fucking earned it. Holy shit! But um, I mean, my God, yeah, the, the great, honestly, the the greatest composer ever. He really, like, yeah, and, and without a doubt. And it's the thing. I, I I think he is the greatest composer ever. But I don't think I'd ever want him to do a Bond film, even in his prime. No, and his, his 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 sound is just not. The Bond sound, which goes back to what, what what I was sort of talking about before. I think, right? In, uh, there's a particular sound with Bond, and, I, and there's no doubt he could do it. Like, he could do it, right? Like he could definitely, probably do it. Um, right. The man is just—he's very versatile. He's well, and and especially he comes from a jazz no, background. He does, yeah. So and that's, I think, but yeah. um, I just don't, I just don't hear him doing that. I don't know. I, I, I just—he's never done anything quite like a Bond score, and I just, I. It, I don't know, because I mean, he's done stuff it'd be, like it'd be Bond adjacent. Yeah. He's done like I mean, um, you could say that um, you could argue that Catch Me If You Can is Bond adjacent, but I don't know if he's uh, even that didn't sound like a Bond score to me. If that makes any sense, I, th- these are I'm right, using right, right. like like subjective, emotive words when I use it when I describe these composers. Um, right, I mean, but but like I I get it, te- like cause yeah. I, I'm on a technical. I'm, level, while I think he'd do a good job, hmm. it would be. Interesting. And that's the thing. On a technical level, there's no reason any of these composers couldn't do a Bond score. Or, exactly. Um, like, then there's, there's nothing technically wrong with any of Thomas Newman's scores. Um, technically, they're excellent pieces of music. It's just... It's just about that sound. It's about that feeling that, that you get listening to it. And uh, yeah, there's a multitude yeah, yeah. of technical reasons why those sounds are achieved and why I associate them with Bond. But... I mean, I'm really not in a position to really like start like, <laughs> like writing an academic paper yeah. about it. I, I don't know enough about it to really um, sort of put my th- my my thoughts into words. So I'm just going to use the emotive language and sort of convey what I mean without actually saying it. But um, sure, sure. Yeah, I don't. I I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I, I just think if they find someone, anyone who can do that sound with that energy. Then we're good. I honestly, I mean, get David Arnold yeah. first of all. But if you can't, yeah, I mean, then- <laughs> if David Arnold, you know, won't pick up the phone for whatever too busy reason, picking then- up Michael Giacchino at the airport or something at the airport, <laughs> he misses the call <laughs> for sure. the broccoli because he's picking him up. Yeah, oh, that would. Oh my god, like, I guess that's he's like not a- interested anymore. Let's just get Thomas Newman uh- again. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember we did have that one report that it said that Thomas Newman was going to be coming back to score yeah. the film, but that was before Danny Boyle. That was before. So, which yeah, I didn't the- believe any of that because I mean that's that's how I, I, I remember when we talked about um, Christoph Waltz and he said he didn't he wasn't coming back. He doesn't know yeah. that because they're writing a new script now. You know what I mean? Like he he was just saying it, and I feel like a lot of these stories with people just speculating. T- making educated bets, but not like right. confirmed. Um, going back to the Danny Boyle thing, I yeah. I do think that Daniel Pemberton is now a. I I feel like he actually could be in the conversation because to do a score, of, yeah. a Bond score, because he's worked with Danny Boyle before, which most also recently, begs the is that question. His most recent film. Uh, no, because he did T two. Train spot. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. Train spotting two is his most recent. Yeah, is is, is Danny Boyle's most recent film? That's which what I meant. I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I do not believe that. Daniel Pemberton scored that. No. Um, I think he got the original. I mean, I don't even know what the music... I can't even think of any of the music in that movie. I, I can't even think of it. I never I never saw uh, T2 train oh, spotting. Uh, no. That's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was never the biggest train spotting fan. But any, anyways, getting, getting back on topic. I the, the next question that a lot of people kind of brought up with, um, you, you know, Danny Boyle... Uh, directing Bond 25, John Murphy. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, John M- Murphy, who's done many of his past. Um, I mean, famously, he's. I think films. his most famous track like, score is um, 28 Days Later. Yeah, that exactly. Awesome. Oh, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, I don't think he belongs anywhere near a Bond film, personally. Just his style is just completely off. Uh, I'd agree with that, yeah. It's just, you know. Um, no, I, I I don't I don't like it. I know a lot of people are like, oh, John Murphy Bond score. It's like, well, okay, let's let's take a step back here and let's think about this. First of all, John Murphy hasn't worked with Danny Boyle in quite some time, um, and also his style. It's just it's not Bond. So um, I I have two more names I want to throw at you real quick. Just let me get your quick yeah, thoughts on it because we're kind of running well, running long on time here. Well, I was just, uh, just, just going to say um, for T two, it was mostly just um, soundtrack. Like, yeah, like like like. like um, 
already existing music being put into a soundtrack. Oh, yeah. right, so right, right, So it right. means the last time Danny Boyle needed an orchestral score, he went with Daniel Pemberton, so... Yes, ooh, for ooh, ooh, uh, ooh. Steve Jobs. Yeah. yeah that's right. Good stuff. All right, I got two, two names I want to quickly throw out to you. Just want to get your uh, thoughts. Yeah. So the first one is Henry Jackman, who composed the Kingsman scores. That's the only reason I bring him up. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think he could do Bond? No. I mean, he could, no. he could but I don't, I don't think I want that. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. He's Henry Jackman is kind of hit or miss with me, and I, and I know this is. I, I know you disagree with me on this. Um, I I thoroughly like him. I yeah. while I, well, and I'll also say this: while I thoroughly like him, I'm also in the same boat. I don't know if I'd feel comfortable with him but tackling I mean, like, uh, a Bond score. It's not like he couldn't do it though. Is the thing because no, I mean you look at like, his work on Kingsman. It's Kingsman very, is very you know, Bondy, but so is um, First Class. Um, oh yeah, I didn't even which think was about quite that. like his Magneto music was very Bond. Um, so it's not yeah. like he couldn't do it, and that's why I'm like torn. It's just like I just don't know if I would trust him to do it. You you would yeah. have to hear. It would be one of those things where it's like if he did it, you'd have to hear it, and then you'd be able to be like, okay, yeah, that was a bad decision. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he could definitely. Yeah. He's definitely capable of doing it. He's definitely capable. Right, of that sound. right. He's also he is a talented person. I don't want to make it sound like I hate him. I I really like First Class is one of my favorite of his scores, and it's I I listen to it frequently. I love it. But um, yeah, yeah. No, 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 for sure, for sure. Okay, and just to wrap up this conversation, the last name I'll throw at you, um, one of the most um, prolific names in the scoring um, business. Uh, do you want to guess it, or do you want me to give it to you? Nah, give it to me. Uh, Alan, Silvest- Alan Silvestri. Uh, no. no. No? You think he's too fantastical, too magical? Um, No, because I, I don't want to pigeonhole him, because, I mean, that, that, just because he do- he's done films like that doesn't mean he couldn't do a Bond film. I just think... Mm-hmm. He's in the same camp as like John Williams. He's more, tr- yeah. He's very. He's more traditional. More traditional. More like sort of, like yeah. He, he's, and he's very good and he's iconic. But um, yeah. I don't know. I I, just, I think there's more of a. He's, he's more of a traditional. I, I, I'm really having a hard time imagining him do like. Dun, 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 dun. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. It would be it would be really interesting. I'll, well, oh, God, I I know we're kind of running low on time <laughs> here, but one more name that I want to throw Go out here. It. Um, it's unfortunate that he's uh, no longer with us because I I oh, would no, kill to hear what his name his his score would be. Um, Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, so because he is he was so experimental mm-hmm. like John Barry, even more so I'd say experimental than John Barry. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's one of the most iconic composers of all time. That'd be really cool. He'd be, he's a nice marriage of like that John Williams like sound and that. Like Hans Zimmer, like sound. Well, in, not, in, not in the, terms of the, not in terms of like musical quality or musical like um like not, not not when I say sound, I don't mean like literal sound. I just mean it's like yeah, their um their mo. You know what I mean? Like their their approach yeah, to yeah, composition. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and there's one score that I'll leave you with, which if you want to hear Jerry Goldsmith's closest interpretation to a Bond score, weirdly enough, his score for Looney Tunes back in action. Huh, huh. That told me right there that he's capable of doing it. You know who's it. in Looney Tunes back in action? Brendan Fraser. Timothy Dalton. <laughs> oh, yes! I forgot! Oh, God! I mean, how did I forget that? Yes! Uh, I thought, <laughs> Of course, Timothy Dalton. Oh, so right there, he was already doing, like, Bond riffs, absolutely. kind of, uh, like, wah, wah, like, just... Uh, so that right there tells you that Jerry Goldsmith could have done a Bond film uh, if it wasn't for his unfortunate passing, yeah. but um, I think the thing we can agree on is that we don't want to let Danny Elfman anywhere near... <laughs> This score. <laughs> I don't hate Danny Elfman like you do, but I, I agree. He's not. The, he doesn't have the. Uh, his sound does not belong in Bond. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Well, with that, guys, that'll do it for Shaken But Heard. Be, be sure to let us know which your picks for who should compose a Bond score are down in the comment section below. Of wherever you're watching, we would love to hear from you, especially for this topic. And that'll do it for our show this week. Uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed all the stuff we talked about. We went through a lot. Like I said, this is a really juicy show. Got a lot of Danny Boyle news, all that good stuff. So, uh, wherever point you started listening or, or wherever you've been listening, um, let let us know your thoughts on and opinions on all of the topics we've discussed. Let us know in the comment section below of wherever you're watching. Mm-hmm. And then also don't forget the Die Another Day discussion will be happening a few weeks from 
uh, today or whenever this episode is is going up. So don't forget to download the Stardust app. There is a link in the description below. Um, react to Die Another Day and tag G Schiller, G S C H I L L E R. If you tag me in there, there's a chance you'll pop up in our video. So we want to have an open conversation with you. We are looking very much forward, or we are, <laughs> we are very much looking forward. I can't talk. <laughs> Holy crap. We are very much looking forward to uh, interacting with you guys and hearing your thoughts on. One of the uh, most notorious Bond films ever made. <laughs> it's just oh, what a excellent. what a film. Um, but on top of all that, the most important thing is uh, if you guys could just take some time to head on over to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast feed there, and also leave us a rating and a review. That really, really helps us out. It helps the podcast get noticed. Um, it helps us, you know, as, as far as feedback, as far as like what we can do better and all that good stuff. So please, 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 if you could just take like five minutes max, or if even five minutes, and head on over to iTunes, um, click that subscribe button so the episodes are automatically downloaded to your feed. It is free, should mo- mention that, it is free, um, and then please leave us a rating and a review, that would mean the world to us. So, Mr. Brody Saravelli, how, uh, or I'm sorry, where can everyone find you on the internet? You can find me at Brody Saravelli on Twitter, um share with me in my hot takes and whatnot is always a good time um yes that's about it that's what that's the only place you can find me <laughs> that is he's not good i'll give you my home address yeah <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect yes be sure to give him a follow um as always guys uh be sure to like this video share it all the good stuff subscribe to the men versus movies channel for all of our other uh, uh you know hot takes i guess you could say or reviews and, and stuff Every like that Yes, on just film in general, mm-hmm. not just James Bond. Um, and then, guys, if you like me specifically and you like what I've had to say, you can always give me a follow on Twitter at Griff Schiller. All right, that's going to do it for this episode, guys. And until next time, take care. Take care.